right, so webcasting's been around for a while. When you think of webcasting, do you think of this? Well, if you do, check out this. Yeah, you guys should have heard him during the break. I'm sorry, I just have to turn it on the bus here, but all of a sudden we hear a random, wow, I look high. <laughs> this is Bear Rock TV, live all dynamic right. television with an interactive chat. It's going to change the way you watch. Check out tomorrow's media today. Pararocktv.com. Hey guys, this is Sean Burton from Bill TV. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with my lovely co host Kat for Bill TV on Pararocktv.com. Shantown rocks. 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 This is Catman. Shantown totally rocks. Carl Lawson. And Shantown rocks. All right, joining me in the studio is John Karabi, formerly of Motley Crue and uh, Rat and Union and, boy, you name it. The man has uh, quite a resume. John, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, glad to have you. First of all, congratulations on the new album. I was uh, checking things out and absolutely awesome. Unbelievable. That's cool, man. Thank you. Yeah, I had a good time doing this one. It was cool. A little different than what I'm, I'm, I normally do, but... Uh, the response has been great, and I had a lot of fun, you know, recording this thing. So it's been cool. Very cool. I was in the first song that really jumps out at me. It, it kind of feels like an instant classic when I was listening to it. Is "Love I Don't Need You Anymore." Is it? Is what kind of reaction are you getting to that? You know, well, actually, there's a few of the songs on there. I, you know, if you're familiar with my back history, there's probably half the record is stuff that I recorded before in my previous bands. Um, there's a couple of Scream songs on there, a couple Motley, and a couple of Union songs. And um, <clears throat> Love I Don't Need It Anymore was the, one of the songs from the first Union album. And um, it's just one of those tunes, man. It's weird. Like, you know, I play it live. Um, the minute I start playing that guitar riff, the audience connects with it. I don't know what it is about that song. I don't know if it's the story, the lyric line, whatever, but it's just something that connects with everybody. And I just got done doing seven weeks in Europe and almost every night of the week, the response to that song was just incredible. It's overwhelming. So it's been cool. I love that tune. Amazing. Amazing. And uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to play that song here for you guys in just a minute. Uh, John, you want to introduce the song? Okay, this is Love I Don't Need It Anymore from John Karabi Unplugged. Morning light lands on a face, another day begins. In her eyes, there's a story. Who's been disappointed once again So she combs her hair Washes her face Sings her favorite song Forces out a smile Now a song is saying But a world is strange Everything she helps to be
You know, and uh, I've got my favorites. I know the fans have their favorites. I'm going to guess Shannon's favorite is going to be Crash. And I, I, I really, that, that song really strikes me as something that is much different than mostly anything else on the album. Uh, it, it, is that one also getting attention? And, and uh, how did that one come You know, it's, it's so weird. The response that I've been getting from this record is, it's funny. There's no real standout like song that everybody hands down goes that's the one um i just read a review uh somebody uh joe from rat pack sent me a review and um the guy gave me an incredible review on the record and his two favorite songs was open your eyes and are you waiting and then some some like crash some like if i had a dime some love hooligans. It, it's just, it's all over the place. So I can't really, it's like I'm trying to do it. I want to do a video for one of the songs on the record, and I just don't know which one to do because everybody's got a different favorite. You know what I mean? It's weird. That is cool. So, it? Something on there for everybody. That's for sure. Yep. A little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, from John Karabi Unplugged, this is Crash. <laughs> Discomfort in her eyes Her words went on forever And took me by surprise She let me down before I thought she found the way Jesus, can you help me Find something to say She's giving up She's letting go
Now, I want to talk about the ride a little bit. I mean, you've been all over the world promoting the album. Uh, let's talk about the ride. You went to Rome for the first time. How was that? Yes. I was, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to see anything. Um, you know, it, it, it's so weird. Again, like I tell my, my friends are all, you know, they, they all have the office jobs and different things like that. And they, you know, whine and moan with me all the time. They're like, oh, man, you sucks. You get to go here and there. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I don't see anything. Like, I can tell you how the hotel rooms were in each city I've been in. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, I was in Rome, like one of the most historic cities on earth, you know, and it's like, I, I, like, I never got to see the Colosseum or any of that great stuff, you know? So, um, but the, the audience was amazing. I do remember we had an amazing show it was sold out. The kids were great. They sang every word. And, you know, that's basically my memories of it, every city that I usually go to. But, it, it, you know, it's very much the TV age. If you look at all the, the you know, everything that's been happening with Brett Michaels, you know, in the last five or six years, mm -hmm. um, you know, he went from being just, you know, Brett from Poison to being like Brett, the, you know, household name. Right. You know what I mean? Brett Michaels. Brett the brand, even and, more so on television. Yes. Yeah, totally. And I think television has a lot to do with that. You know, if you look at, a, you know, God, five minutes on a Jay Leno show or David Letterman or something like that performing, it then it immediately gives you a mass audience, but they can see the face. They can see the face and put it to the voice and put it to the name and all that other stuff. And I've never done any of that. Mm -hmm. I've never done it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had dreadlocks, short hair, long hair, beard, no beard, you know, whatever. <laughs> Witness so protection I, I, program I don't kind of stuff. For people either. <laughs> yeah, with, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I am Italian, so what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, great, great question from Art on our Facebook page, uh, kind of what you're talking about here. What do you think of today's music as a business, and, and how has it changed in the last 20 years? And I think you're kind of touching upon that with the whole infusion of YouTube and Facebook. And, and how do you see that changing things in the next 10 years, let's say? Well, you know, to be honest with you, like, I, I think everybody's kind of figuring it out now as they go, um, uh, you know, because it is, it is pretty wide open right now. You know, I, I think a lot of guys, a lot of guys, it, you know, that come from my time area or, you know, my, my time frame of, of playing music. Yeah, I, I, it's it's really hilarious. Like I go, I went, especially for some reason in the UK, I could not get internet at all. <laughs> really, I mean, I can say that about every country we went to. Um, Romania was the worst. Yeah, some some of them, you know, you, look, look when you when you're when you're on the interstate and you look around and you realize that everybody's driving in a buggy with a horse, you're like, uh, pretty the internet's pretty not pretty much not going to happen. Yeah. But it was weird if for some reason, like, UK, like, I was all through Germany, Spain, uh, you know, all, all these different places, and, you know, checked into these, I, I usually stay maybe in, like, the smaller bed and breakfasts, um, and, they, and they supplied me with internet for free, it was, like, part of the package, you know what I mean? And then I got to UK, and it was like, okay, that'll be 20 pounds for 24 hours, which yeah. is like forty dollars American, yep. <laughs> and yep. it, 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 and then it doesn't work. The only place it works is in the lobby, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that really makes the whole that really makes the whole like, you know, sexting thing and and like video conference calls. You know, it kind of makes things a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the internet access in Budapest was forty dollars U.S. per day. If that's not rape, I don't know what it is. That's ridiculous. Yeah, but it's like it's okay if you buy me a drink first. That's right. <laughs> I'm okay with it. <laughs> that's right. And uh, you guys have a lot in common, including uh, a little, uh, maybe a little on Shannon's side of things. John, you got a, a, a story to share with her. Yeah, it, it's you know I don't know. It's not like I. I it's not like. Um, you know, it's not like I went to like a haunted house or a haunted hotel and like saw a, you know, you know, ghost or anything like that. But it, it, it was weird. And I've, I've always kind of remembered this. So when Joe was talking to me about the show, I, I said, yeah, 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 I got, I got one. You know, I don't know how interesting they're going to find it, but I, I was basically married. Um, I'm since then divorced, but 
I, I recently got married. It was like 2001. And prior to this, I had met uh, my wife's grandmother, but I only met her like one time. Really sweet woman. And for some reason, she really kind of took to me. So later, you know, a little while later, she had a stroke after I'd met her. And, and even her family was saying, like, it was so weird. But every person that came into the room, every male person that came into the room, she called them John, like like her, even her own son, her husband, like, you know, she was 80 years old, whatever. But she called everybody John. So for some reason, I had this weird connection with her. Well, then, you know, she passed away. And then about um, probably about five or six months later, we got ma married, uh, my wife and I. And then she went on tour shortly afterwards. And then we started to have some issues, some problems, because she was not calling and just not staying in touch. And I kind of thought something was weird. So I went to sleep one night. I was in my apartment. I got home from tour. She was out on tour and I had this weird thing. Like my cat was freaking out like the whole day, like just running around acting weird, like tail was all bushy. And <clears throat> so I went to sleep and I had the most vivid dream about her grandmother. And it was weird. Like her grandmother, I apparently in my dream, I was in a hotel and her grandmother came and knocked on my door and she said, have you seen, you know, your wife? And I'm like, no, I haven't seen her. I can't get a hold of her, blah, 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 whatever. She took my hand and she walked me down this corridor and took me to a hotel room. And we knocked on the door and walked in. And apparently in my dream, my wife was in there having an affair with another guy. So I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And I, I like walked out of the room and this whole commotion started in the room. It was so weird. Like I, you know, and so I went back to my room and I was packing a duffel bag. And the only thing I was putting in the duffel bag was the book of the movie, What Dreams May Come, <laughs> okay. which is kind of odd. Yeah. Well, then, you know, so I got up the next day, you know, I, I woke up, you know, the following morning. And I just I, it was just weird. My it was my like my apartment was like super cold. My cat was still freaking out. And I had noticed that my cat knocked all these books off the bookshelf and he was still just kind of like freaking out. Like he was like looking at the ceiling and he was running in a circle and all this other weird stuff. So I'm just sitting there going, wow, that was a really, really weird dream. Well, I wound up calling my ex-wife and I told her the dream at which point she completely broke down and hysterically started crying and told me that everything that I had saw in the dream almost in detail uh, was exactly what had happened the night before she she had actually been cheating on me and she finally fessed up and told me but the weird thing was, is I remembered the room number. I remembered the room number and everything. And it, the weirdest part of it was when I told her the room number, that was the room number her and the guy were staying in the night before. Wow. So I, I just kind of assumed that I had like some sort of, you know, like her grandmother was very upset with her. In the dream, she was very upset with her, with her. And you know, whatever, you know, so I basically had, I felt like I had some sort of, uh, visitation or some, something from her grandmother to try and kind of wake me up and say, Hey, this is what's going on. Like, this isn't right. Whatever. And things didn't work out between us. Um, you know, she wound up, we wound up getting a divorce and all this other stuff anyway, but I thought it was really odd that I knew the room number. Right. Um, I described the room and she had told me, she told me later, like after we got a divorce and all this other kind of stuff that it freaked her out um, to the point that I was able to describe the room, the candles, the incense, like the whole, like it, like it was like I was there. Wow. 
I was gonna say now, nowadays they just call that stalking, but that's. <laughs> yeah. Shannon, what yeah, do you, nowadays what, it's called stalking, yeah. but whatever. What do you think of that, Shannon? Do you do you think paranormal experience, incredible coincidence? What what's your thought on that kid? That's gonna be probably one of the best stories I've ever heard. That's not fake. That's, my guess is that's definitely something paranormal related. Somebody's definitely giving you that information, and if you've never had a psychic moment in your life, John, then that's definitely somebody contributing that that information to you. Yeah, it's it's weird because I've had, I've I've actually had that one, and I had one other. If you've got a minute, it, it was really short. But it, even back when I was with the Scream, we uh, we were rehearsing, and it, the same kind of thing happened where we were all sitting around. It was it was almost like a deja vu kind of thing, and uh, we were sitting in the rehearsal room, and. The, the, the guys in my band, uh, the, the guitar player, the bass player, and the drummer were sitting on the drum riser, and we were discussing a tune. And it was so weird, like my guitar player, Bruce Bouillet, he actually picked up a thermos, like the silver thermos, and he opened it and he started pouring coffee. And right then I went, whoa. And the guys were like, what's wrong? Because I was in mid-sentence when he did it, and I go, I'm having a really weird deja vu and it's not a good one. Not a good one. Wow. So they go, okay, well, so I go lock the door, lock the rehearsal door. And we were in this weird area of uh, Van Nuys rehearsing. And uh, they locked the door and I started to explain to them, I said, it was so weird. I'm having a deja vu about this. Like, it's weird. Like I, 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 I just had this deja vu when I saw the thermos and I go, like I had this thing that these guys are going to come and beat us. And as I was saying it to them, all of a sudden somebody started pounding on the door and we had a little keyhole and it was like 10 guys out there with like baseball bats and chains and all this other oh. stuff. <laughs> and they, and they go, it's, so we yelled out the door. We're like, Hey, you know, what's up? Well, apparently there was this rehearsal, you know, a bunch of rehearsal rooms. We were in one of them. And somebody that was in one of the other rehearsal rooms had ripped these guys off. They did like some sort of pot deal, like drug deal, and they got ripped off. So they came back and they were just going to like, you know, kick our asses, pardon my French. But it, it was just the, the weirdest thing. So I've had a couple of little things like that little. in my life where I'm like, <laughs> uh maybe, maybe John's a looper, Shannon. Maybe he's like that movie we yeah, saw. He's a looper. <laughs> He goes and time travels like five minutes at a time. Maybe that's yeah, the case. John. Those aren't little things. Those are pretty significant. Those are definitely significant. I think you're cool. born with a little bit of a gift, there, buddy. Yeah. Be, besides playing guitar and singing, no kidding. Right. All right. I'm in. I'm in antenna. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, you should charge for readings, buddy. Charge for readings. Incredible stuff there. I, I didn't realize. And, and it's funny because Shannon brings that out in everybody. We could be talking to, you know, we've talked to, uh, I don't know, we've talked to Micah Ruzioni from the 1980 Olympic hockey team. We've talked to uh, uh, the Blueberry Girl from uh, Willy Wonka. Everybody seems to have a paranormal story around Shannon. It's kind of kind of cool how it brings that out in people. But yours is amazing. That's amazing shit. Yeah, the, the, one, with, the one with her grandmother thing that, that kind of freaked me out because I, I like I said I had only met the woman like once or twice you know what I mean really brief and she lived in Minnesota I lived in LA and and she had passed away and you know it was this weird you know it was this really weird thing you know and then when I had that dream it was like I literally knew the room number I described the room like just like you everything. were there like you were there. Like I was there, that's, you know what I mean? And then the fact that my cat was freaking out. I know they say animals are a lot more sensitive to that kind of stuff. We've experienced that ourselves when uh, our, our home was actually on A&E channel for an episode of Paranormal State. And, and uh, when I first met my wife, I, I can be honest. I mean, I grew up a Catholic, you know, all that stuff and believed in the devil and God. And, but I thought she was a whack job when it came to, like, communicating with the dead and stuff. I wasn't buying into all this. I was very much a realist. And when stuff started mm -hmm. happening here, it was because of you mentioned, like the animals. Uh, we saw two of our dogs that never make a peep on opposite sides of the room, transfixed on a point in the center of the ceiling, just going nuts. And, and it, I'm sure it gave you know the kind the same kind of feeling that uh, I'm sure you did with your cat freaking out. You noticed that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was weird. Like my cat was normally really, really mellow, and 
it was weird about, you know, I, like I said, I was kind of going through like a weird thing and, and, you know, with her already, the, the wife and, and, you know, so what, it was weird, you know, but normally he was just really mellow, the cat. And then probably, I would say probably about seven or eight o'clock that night before I went to sleep, he just started freaking out. He was like running around the apartment and he would like run up along the back of the couch and then just stop and freeze and arch his back and his tail was all full and right. just freaking out. Yeah, not not the so, uh, anticipated behavior that you usually see. Exactly. Yeah. And then I went to sleep and immediately went to sleep and, you know, like I and then I had this I, I had this weird dream. And, uh, you know, like I said, I was in the room, the knock, uh, you know, the grandmother showed up. She was very perturbed and very angry at her granddaughter, uh, you know, asked me if I had talked with her. And she's like, I want to show you something. And she took me down the hall into the other room. And there they were. Boom. And I like I knew who the guy was. I, you know, I knew the room number. I could describe the room like the whole bit. So the next day when I called her. I thought I just had a weird dream and I was kind of pissed at her for not staying in touch with me. And then when I explained the dream to her, she just kind of lost it. It's almost, and, like, it's almost like checkmate. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do at that point? Right. Yeah. And wow. it's weird. She finally fessed up and told me that she had been having a, having an affair and wow. you know, all this weird stuff. And it just wound up, it, you know, went South or whatever, but it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty interesting, man. I never forgot that. Oh, I bet. John Karabi, ladies and gentlemen, joining us tonight. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I've been listening to a couple of your interviews. And, and one thing that strikes me, uh, as you mentioned in one of your interviews, is that people still come up to you after all you've done, the bands that you've been with, the, the multi-albums that you've put out. They still come up to you sometimes and say, who are you? And, and what are you doing here? And, and it must be something that motivates you. And, and getting, of course, to the, the album, Unplugged, is this something that well, you find maybe had a little extra motivation? Because, the, you know, obviously, Unplugged is all you. Well, I, I mean, one of the things that I did want to do, like, I did want to try a, just, a, like, you know, take a shot at a solo career. One of the things that people did, or did kind of motivate me is, uh, you know, on the other hand, I'll, I'll meet people uh, that are familiar with me from the Motley record, and they'll say something like, oh, I, I really love the Motley record, or I'm a big fan of your voice, or I love the Scream and Motley thing. Well, what have you been doing since Motley? And, you know, so I just sit there and I laugh about it because I go, man, I've done five records since I was in <laughs> Motley. Like, I did the Union stuff. You know, I did a couple of other records. And, you know, the fact that they're not connecting me with a band name then maybe I should just try this solo thing, you sure. know what I mean, and see how that how that flies. Yeah. And um, you know, so far so good, you know. But a, a lot of it, though, too, with me is I was just explaining this to my manager and to Joe from Rad Pack. Um, you know, throughout my entire career, I've probably done eight or nine records with some big bands, mm -hmm. and in all of the years that I've been touring and working and doing all this other stuff, I've never done. I've never been on TV other than a couple of videos that were on MTV. Um, I've never done any sort of TV. So right. I think a lot of it is that people can't place the face with the name. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they, they, you know, it is the information age. It is the computer age. It is the, but it, it you know, it's very much the TV age. If you look at all the, the, you know, everything that's been happening with Brett Michaels, you know, in the last five or six years, mm -hmm. Um, you know, he went from being just, you know, Brett from Poison to being like Brett, the, you know, household name, right. you know what I mean? Brett Michaels. Brett the brand, even and, more so on television, yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think television has a lot to do with that. You know, if you look at, a, you know, God, five minutes on a Jay Leno show or David Letterman or something like that performing, it then it, it immediately gives you a mass audience but they can see the face. They can see the face and put it to the voice and put it to the name and all that other stuff. And I've never done any of that. Mm -hmm. I've never done it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, to be honest with you, like I, I think everybody's kind of figuring it out now as they go, um, uh, you know, cause it is, it is pretty wide open right now. You know, I, I think a lot of guys, a lot of guys, it, you know, that come from 
my time area or you know my my time frame of of playing music are reinventing themselves and figuring out how to do it now Mm -hmm. where i have a son who's in a band you know they put a video out and they go on tour it's a younger crowd like the, the younger kids now totally use the internet for everything yep and i i did a video three or four months ago and i put it on youtube and i've got like you know 10 or twelve thousand hits on it fifteen thousand hits mm-hmm. my son did a video around the same time and that whole younger generation that uses youtube for everything um they've got 125,000 hits. <laughs> yeah. it's it's the god's honest truth you know in a way is is the acoustic stuff a way of reinventing yourself as well is it something that you know you always wanted to do is it is it coming together for you like that as far as a reinvention yeah well i, I think i think a lot, a lot of people are surprised by it uh, you know for me you know everybody looks at it on one hand because it's john karabi now like you said earlier um everybody goes oh that's kind of odd why would you do for your first solo record why would you do an acoustic album and I go, well, it's not really my first record, it's my ninth, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Um, so for me, this was just something I've always wanted to do. Um, pretty much every song that I've ever written throughout my career anyway has started on an acoustic guitar. So it's not that much of a stretch for me to do acoustic material. Mm-hmm. And if you're familiar with my history, pretty much every record I've ever done had at least two acoustic songs on it. Mm-hmm. So I just figured, why not, you know? And But the other thing is, too, it does, to a degree, it does kind of show people that there's other elements of my voice that they've probably never heard before. You know, people are so used to hearing me scream Hooligans Holiday that when they actually hear the song stripped down and in its purest form, now they can hear, they can hear, you know, and I... I I tweak the vocal a little bit. I'm not, I'm, I sing the verses probably an octave lower than I do with Motley. But, you know, it's, it, you know, I'm singing. And I think it's kind of taken people by surprise. They're like, oh, wow, you know, yeah, his voice is pretty good, you know, whatever. Yep. So um, I, I don't know, man. You know, it's, I, I didn't really think of a lot of it. I just always wanted to do an acoustic record. And I just said, why not? Let's give it a shot, you know. But everybody's kind of digging into the, who, what, when, where, why, and how of, of you know, the, the, the my thought process in doing this thing. And there really wasn't one. I just wanted to do one. Very cool. So. Very cool. And, and definitely, you know, when you when you talk about singing from the rafters, that's what I got from most of the album. I mean, just you just brought it right right from the rafters, and, and kudos for that. Um, another Facebook fan says, uh, Kim, Kim Bartnicki from the uh, Cat Club former friend of yours so she knows you're from happening harry too she says hello remember kim oh yes actually i think she wrote to me on facebook um i think she heard that i was doing the show today so um she wrote to me and uh tell her i said hello i actually didn't get a chance to write back because i've been just catching up with a bunch of different things but um yeah, the Cat Club days, man, that was cool. I had a great time at that place. It's a shame it's not there anymore, but um, it was a great hang and a great place, and I, I have a bunch of great friends that I met from there, so it was it was very cool. Awesome, awesome. You, you know, you'd mentioned before uh, in an interview that you were wondering what it was going to take to turn the corner and hit that next level for you. Do you feel you're there yet? No, I, I just kind of feel like, you know, for me um, – you know, throughout my career, um, due to just the circumstances that I was handed, you know, everybody, you know, some people comment on, oh, I, I really liked, you know, I thought the Molly record was really good, but the Scream record, that was the one, man. I really dug the Scream album. Like, you should have stuck with that, and, you know, or you should have stayed with Motley, or you should have done this. And it's just weird, you know, like, I never planned on being in a bunch of different bands. I never planned on, uh, leaving the scream and joining motley once i had the motley gig i i wasn't even thinking about the what if of not being in the band anymore it was just the cards that i was dealt and because of it i feel like i've gotten i i get you know if you could draw an imaginary line in the air a horizontal line 
and everything above it is fame and everything below it is obscurity. Um, I kind of feel like I'm just scratching, like my back is rubbing across the back of that, you know, or the bottom of that line. I'm like right there, you know, and it's just, it's just the cards that I've been dealt and, and, you know, I I can sit here and, you know, where I'm sure there's other people out there that feel the same way I do about their careers, but, you know, you can sit and whine and complain about it, or you can just continue to, you know, you can continue to just try and, and achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. And that's what I'm doing. You know, I, I still feel with as many records as I've done in the past, you know, I still feel like I haven't done my, you know, epic record yet, or I haven't done my, you know, my big record hasn't come yet, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm still plugging away. Well, what I get from you, John, is, is a huge sense of appreciation. And, and you know, there, there's, and I equate it to athletes all the time. I've, I've had the, the, uh, the opportunity, uh, the gracious opportunity to talk to many pro athletes. And, uh, you know, you get a few guys that are pompous and you get the guys that are, are, are almost unapproachable. But then you get that guy that really, really, really appreciates the fact that he's doing what he loves, being able to do it around the world and meet people and make a pretty pretty damn good living at it. And, and uh, that's what I get from you. I mean, you've been in the business a long time. You, you're reinventing yourself again. You've kind of played the free agent, if I can draw that analogy, uh, in a couple of instances. And, and, and off you go again with an acoustic album. So I, I think that's great stuff, John. That's awesome. I, You know, and, and, and that's the thing. You know, it was like I was saying, you know, I, I was just talking to my son. And I just, you know, he's he's thinking about going back to school. And he's saying, I want to do this and I want to do that. And the only advice I could give him is just make sure whatever it is that you go to school for, it's something you can picture yourself doing and be happy doing 30 years from now. Cause the last thing you want to do is like, like, and I find it with anybody, man, you, you, you want to do that thing that you just cannot wait to get out of bed and go to work and do your thing. You know what I mean? And I, I, I love that. And I've had, believe me, I've had my moments of doubt and self doubt and all this other kind of stuff. And, you know, it's just weird. The one thing that I can say, my dad actually told me a couple of years ago, he said, man, you're, you're, a, you're, you're, dude, you're a big man. And he said, the one thing my dad was, a, wanted to be an artist and he did what everybody thought was, or he did what was expected of him. He got married, he had a kid, then he had three more kids and he got a job and he, you know, and I, my dad's had a good life, you know what I mean? But I don't think he's had a bad life or he regrets anything about his life, but he could have taken a different path. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. about two or three years ago, I was having an issue where I was just kind of looking around and, it, you know, I, I, I was just, I, I was taking stock, which I think a lot of people do throughout their lives. And you look and you go, oh man, I've done all this stuff and what do I have to show for it? What do I have? Mm -hmm. And my dad kind of stopped me and he said, wait a minute, hold on. You know, you've, done what you wanted to do you've played music you travel the world you play a guitar and you sing for people and doing that he goes yeah you've had your rough spots where you've been up and down or whatever he goes but at the end of the day you basically took care of your mother who was sick dying of cancer you had a son who's a diabetic you took care of him you've had two ex-wives two kids like you took care of everybody mm -hmm. And doing what you want to do like you I, should be loving life man it should be life is great <laughs> you know what i mean it's not bad it's great stop looking at the cup half empty i got i gotta ask you and he's right is this your is this the same dad that may have said to you at one time get a real job <laughs> yeah but, well this is the same dad that asked me when i joined motley crew my dad is very nuts and bolts i love him to death he's 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 a straight shooter he doesn't play any games you know, and he's just, he's, he's a nuts and bolts guy. And he, and so when I joined Motley, he goes, Motley, you know, who's this Motley crew guy? And he could not understand why I would leave a band that was already signed with a record out to join a band called Motley crew. Who are they? <laughs> so I go, dad, they're, they're huge. It's a huge, huge band, massive. And he goes, huh. 
do they have benefits? <laughs> and I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes, Dad, they have benefits. Dad, I can't even begin to tell you about the benefits. In more ways than you have. can comprehend, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, good good to see uh, still family roots. Uh, my dad also being a great inspiration for me growing up and. I always realized, you know, that there's certain people out there that just absolutely don't want to uh, work their lives making somebody else's dream come true. You know, there, there's people that want to get out there, aren't afraid to dream, uh, my wife being one of them. You know, she, she in a bad economy is still kicking ass, doing her thing, been on television, and, uh, you know, doing what she wants to do. And you got to hand it to people like you guys that, that make it happen. You're not afraid to, uh, to reach for it and go for it. And I'm sure it's not without a lot of sacrifice. Well, you know, I got to be honest with you, man, you know, like, I, you know, I, again, it, it, not to be weird, but I was born and raised in Philadelphia. My parents were, you know, we lived in a nice neighborhood. They weren't, they weren't wealthy. It wasn't like we had, a, you know, extra money for vacations and, and, you know, whatever. It was tough. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> like it, until I joined Motley, I didn't really have anything to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a, you know, I was married with two kids and a dog living in a one bedroom apartment in Hollywood, mm-hmm. barely making ends meet. Even when I was in the screen, we weren't making money, it, you know. And when I got the Motley gig, I had a million dollars in the bank. It was awesome. Wow. But then again, like I was talking about earlier, life has a way of leveling some people out. And right when I got the Motley gig, my mom got diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. My son got diagnosed with diabetes. My wife and I started having issues, um, you know, and just one thing after another, it just kind of fell out and I made it work and, and, and I continue to make it work, you know, but it's, it's not easy. I mean, sometimes there's, you know, I'll look at my bank account and I'll look and, and I'll look around and go, oh God, you know, I have the same stress and worries as everybody else, you know, and, and uh, you know, so it's, I have my ups and downs, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, I'm 53 years old. This is all I know how to do. I can play a guitar, I can play an A chord, and I can sing a melody over it. <laughs> and, and do a hell of a job at it, my friend. John Karabi is our guest tonight. And, John, before we let you go, um, what do you got going on? You got a lot of stuff going on. I know they can visit you on your website, which is johnkarabi.com. And uh, where yep. can everybody find out what's going on with you? Um, well, I have, uh, I have, you know, a Facebook fan page, uh, johnkarabi.com. Um, you know, I use all the mediums, MySpace, Twitter, all that other kind of stuff as well. So I'm, I'm out there and, um, you know, there's, I, I'm, I, it's going to be a good year. We got the, um, I'm leaving actually in about, uh, seven days. I'm going to Russia with a bunch of friends. Uh, kind of break ground in Russia with a, it's kind of a jam band, but um, Bobby Rondinelli and, and Greg Smith from Rainbow. and Very cool. Uh, yeah, so we're going to go over with uh, Jeff Nichols from Black Sabbath and Craig Goldie from Ronnie Dio's band and um, and then a buddy of ours, Chris Slade, that played with ACDC in the firm. And we're just going to go over and rock out for you know, six or seven shows and hang out and do some press and talk to the Russian fans and, you know, try and convince some of our American counterparts to go over there and visit those guys. So I'm doing that. And then I got the cruise in March, the Monsters of Rock cruise. That, so uh, that's things are good, man. It's going to be busy. That's a hell of a time. You get you get the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, designated driver. I mean, he's driving the whole damn boat. And the rest of you guys just get to hang out with the band belly up to the bar have a good time that's cool shit this cruise thing i i did it last year and it was unbelievable like there's fans from i met fans from japan france all uh, just all over europe south america mexico like these kids come from all over the world and there's like 30 bands it's like a festival on water nice and it's just amazing it's amazing and everybody was great and there wasn't any fights or no negativity at all it was just it was a really great time so i'm looking forward to doing it again that's cool that those kind of events we we do a few of those not necessarily cruises but we do a lot of events like that and and when you do them for days at a time or weeks at a time you become community almost you know it's kind of cool like that 
Yeah, it's 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 weird, man. Even on this last run that I did in Europe, I was over there in uh, November, uh, end of October and November. And, um, you know, they do this countdown thing to the cruise, uh, you know, weird. But it, it, anyway, I, like, I would honestly say every city I went to, these fans come up and they have a white piece of paper with a number on it. And they want to take a photo and it says like 168 on it. And I'm like, well, what, what is this for? And you're like, oh, it's 168 days till the cruise, you know, <laughs> and it was weird. So it was in Italy and Spain and, and Portugal and Norway and just all over Europe. These fans were coming up almost daily with a new number. Nice. Like, hey, dude, I you know, so it was, it's pretty cool. There's definitely a Monsters of Rock community out there. Um, it's going to be, it, it, it'll be fun. Anybody that, you know, th this year is sold out. The entire boat is sold out. So wow. if you can't do it this year, definitely make plans to do it next year. It's a blast. Good luck on the cruise. Good luck in Russia. And uh, most of all, good luck with the new album, Unplugged. Uh, you can see that again. Get the details on johncarapi.com. And we also want to thank Joe over there at Rat Pack Records. Ratpackrecords.com. You can find information there as well. And, uh, John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. John Karabi has been our guest tonight, formerly of Motley Crue, Rat, Union, and now featuring his new album, Unplugged. You can get it at stores all around the country here and all around the world. Thank you for joining us here on PTV. Until next time, good night.
The show is brought to you in part by Sham Cakes, Fondant Cakes, Buttercream Cakes, and Cupcakes for any occasion. Yummy and delicious signature cupcakes only found at Sham Cakes, 31 Middle Street, Lemonster, Mass. Visit them online at www.shancakes.com or call them today at 978-840-4343. It's okay to cheat on your same old network with us. We won't tell.